We've talked about politics, we've talked about organized crime. Both of those subjects are frequently seen in the movies. Here now to talk about the movies is Elvis Mitchell, film critic for National Public Radio. He interviewed Spike Lee for Playboy magazine, and he is a regular contributor to the new PBS series Edge. And we're pleased to have him on this broadcast because he was a regular on Nightwatch, and it's a pleasure to see you. Well, thank you. And I, the idea of mentioning organized crime and movies in the same <laughs> sentence, I'm sure they love that out in L.A. Amazing how I conceptualize these things, right? You know? Yeah, like I said, you should be running your own talk show. The way you should. pull these ideas I out of the air, Charlie. Show, and this I? is live, too, isn't <laughs> it? That's right. Can we take a call? Yeah. <laughs> yes, for you, Elvis. That's right. Tell him I'm uh, not here. I'm not here. <laughs> He's not here. Tell me about what movies are opening now. I want to just talk about Cape Fear first. Well, Cape Fear is a big one. It's uh, Martin Scorsese's been getting a lot of attention mm -hmm. uh, because Goodfellas was his sort of first legitimate hit after a body of, of phenomenal work, basically. He sort of went ignored in the 80s for a long time. And he made, I think, his best movie, of, uh, the most interesting movie of his career, perhaps. Not his best but The Last Temptation of Christ of, uh, a couple years ago, and it was a project he stuck to for over 10 years. And Cape Fear seems to be kind of a, um, well, it, it, it turns uh, a genre picture into something deeper and more Catholic, and technically it's very flashy, it's, it, it's very effective, but you feel it's sort of working on you. He doesn't have the kind of a emotional commitment he's had to his previous pictures. Why not? Well, because he did this basically for the money. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, right. I mean, he was sort of like asked by De Niro right. and Steven Spielberg, who's one of the producers. They said, yeah. well, Marty, come on, take a look Just at this script. He's going, no, no, I don't want to do this. Yeah. And he said, Marty, take a look at this. And I don't, I don't want to do this. And what he decided he wanted to do with it was like to make it haunted, sort of make the center of the picture original sin. Yeah. In the, uh, the original Cape Fear, there's basically nobody in the movie except for Robert Mitchum as the villain, who's such a vivid and vital sort of rotten, corroded presence. You can't help but root for him. Because Gregory Peck is basically just as a good guy as being, who doesn't have much to do. And De Niro plays the role that Mitchum played, and Nick Nolte plays the Gregory, the Gregory Peck, Peck role. role. And, and how are these performances? Well, if there's going to be a, a star of the 90s at a fairly late point in his life, it's probably going to be Nick Nolte, who's probably the most protean acting presence we have. If John Wayne had talent, he would have been Nick Nolte. <laughs> He's a big American presence who can register really yeah. small shifts of expression with a big slab-like face. And, and he's, his commitment to performance is just amazing. He never mm -hmm. condescends to a performance. And is he good in this new Barbra Streisand film? He's the best thing in the picture. In the <laughs> Why, is that faint praise? Is that damning with faint praise? Well, you might mention organized crime. No, anyway, um, <laughs> it's a movie that's it, it, from a, a popular novel, The, the Prince yeah. of Ties. It's sort of a Pat Conroy. Right has written better books, and he's always writing these books about trying to improve his relationship with his father. There was uh, Conrack, there was um, um, the, the, the um, gosh, the great Santini, right. and then there was the one, the Lords of Discipline. There are always these sort of weird relationships with father figures, and there's the same relationship in this one, except all those relationships are superseded by Barbara Streisand as the shrink who shoots herself so lovingly that it's just humiliating <laughs> to watch. Barbara takes care of Barbara, does she? Well, somebody's got to. <laughs> And it just makes you cringe when there's one scene where Nolte has just made this tearful admission and he's sobbing into her, her bosom and the camera pans up to her and her single tear coming down her cheek. And you think, oh, oh no, yeah. no. <laughs> the, the critic uh, Pauline Kael from The New Yorker had a great line about Streisand once when Streisand was in some TV special with Ray Charles and she was mugging and Kael wrote, dear God, she's stealing scenes from a blind man. <laughs> And that comes to mind. Yeah. She's doing scenes from uh, Emotional Cripple. You, you interviewed Spike Lee for Playboy magazine. You did a piece on Spike Lee and the controversy with Amara Baraka and how this whole Malcolm X film is coming along. Give me an update on that. How is it coming? Is it, is it, it seems to be moving along pretty well, and I think he's probably happy that a lot of the, uh, the attention has sort of moved away from the picture. Yeah. The fact is that, you know, uh, this is post. This is postmodernism. Everybody deserves a chance to say their own thing. He deserves his chance to make his own Malcolm X picture. If Baraka wants to do one, he can certainly go out and raise the money and do it himself. If you had tried to stop uh, Baraka from publishing Culture, his uh, popular culture magazine in the '60s, he would have told you no, and probably things that we can't say here on live TV. <laughs> yes, that's probably so you true. would think he would allow Spike Lee the chance to make his own picture. But and he doesn't because he says that Malcolm was too important for somebody to what? Well, ironically, he says Malcolm belongs to everybody, which is true. I mean this. What's happened is Malcolm has become, become this sort of commercial icon now, and a lot of the sting has been taken out of his image. He's no longer a dangerous character. It's safe to make a movie about him because, in the end, if the picture makes money. Yeah, nobody right. cares how dangerous he is. Um, but Baraka wants to have approval, 
and there are some sort of interesting semantic discussions. For example, Lee saying that uh, he doesn't want these people to see his, his script because it would be censorship, but the this, this studio sees a script every day. Is that not censorship? Yeah. I mean, it, it begs a question. He doesn't have uh, the Woody Allen kind of Final Cut approval. Nobody has that kind of <laughs> yeah, approval true. anymore. That's true. In fact, the studio that has it is barely in existence now, so maybe it's time to think about something else. Any other movies coming out before we switch to the studios and some other things? Well, there's a, there's a, a, a big new Disney uh, animated piece, uh, Beauty and the Beast, their sort of take on the old Cocteau. And the, and the fable, and uh, they're hoping it's going to be their hit. In fact, <laughs> they're hoping a lot, aren't they? Yeah, they, they got a lot riding on this, but this is actually uh, a pretty interesting picture, and Katzenberg says he hopes it will be the first animated film to be nominated for Best Picture. Wall Street <laughs> Journal <laughs> yesterday, Disney hits bad patch after Eisner's six years of giddy expansion. Many of the executives who work in the new team Disney corporate headquarters building here, the one with seven huge stone dwarfs on the pediment, say they hate the place. What's happened at Disney? I mean, this was the place was, which was the model of the new way to make movies. Eisner and Katzenberg and Frank Wells and all these people were all getting fabulously rich, and they said, and people thought they had a lock on how to make the movie business work. Now, you know, that was quite a, kind of a long question. Yeah, it sure was, it. and I'm embarrassed, too. Oh, no, <laughs> if I can quote either Ecclesiastes or Roger <laughs> McGuinn, to everything, turn, turn, there is a season, <laughs> yes. turn, turn. They just sort of, their, their time every, is, is over. It's, or, or every dog has his day or something. And every good dog will have too, but that's another discussion. <laughs> what this comes down to is the fact that they're trying to turn what is basically a gamble into a science. I mean, right. movies right. are luck. They're, they're trying to what? To computerize and create a formula for making movies, and movies are art, and you can't do that? Is I that know movies are art, but movies are certainly this unwieldy thing that becomes something entirely different in yeah. the shooting stage and the cutting stage. You can look... We can, I can think of 10 movies that we probably both think are awful little huge hits that we can't explain, yeah. and great movies, and we can talk about The Last Temptation of Christ again, or, or Taxi Driver, or Mean Streets, these Scorsese pictures yeah. that eluded audiences. And so the fact is, Disney got involved in every step of the way. They sort of took the old Paramount system, when Eisner and Katzenberg were at Paramount, the sort of high concept system. Dillon. Yeah, you sort of like take a movie idea that's as, as commercial as it can be, you polish it and bevel it even more so there's barely anything that feels like art left, but you eliminate as much risk as possible. And you market it like crazy. From every possible way. But the fact is that people have seen that movie now. They've been literally making the same movie more or less for about six years. I've got to move along and get a lot of other things in. How about Columbia now, under, uh, and then it's owned by Sony? Well, that, that between Disney and Sony, I don't know which phenomenon has been written <laughs> yeah, about more. Right. I mean, it's amazing you keep My hearing that, that Sony, they're, lay, they're telling the secretaries there that they have to pay for their own health insurance. At the same time, they just paid Frank Price some huge amount of money, the former president, to move him out of the company. Yeah, just goodbye, yeah. leave, and take the millions with you. I mean, there's a biblical prophecy. And what was the other guy, John? Too. What's his name? The Barbara Streisand former? Oh, John, John Peters. Peters. Yeah, who would yeah, come who made in a zillion dollars on Batman. He's now out of there for another zillion dollars, right? Yeah, you know, they had to pay him off to get him to leave. I mean, what a great <laughs> job. Do they do this in public TV? <laughs> no, I don't think so. A couple of other things. One is the Bugsy Siegel with, with my good friend Warren Beatty. Huh? He talks about you all the time, Joe. You should have played Bugsy. Yeah, right, impact. that's what he said. How is that? Is that a good word on that? What's There's the buzz in Hollywood? Well, the buzz is that uh, Annette Bening getting pregnant during the it's making of it. It's probably like a really big marketing <laughs> ploy on Beatty's part. It's awfully cynical. He's a very savvy marketeer, isn't he? I, I think so, yeah. Um, but the fact is that you hear a lot of things about both good and bad. Yeah. Whole, not a lot of people have seen it. It's still being worked on. They, they want to make it their big Christmas That's release. Warren. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't talk about the Oliver Stone thing. When is that coming out, the JFK? They pushed it up. It was due next year, and they're now trying to get it ready for release. Good for word. Kevin Costner's in it. Plays Jim Garrison. Is, is the early word on that that it's going to be a terrific film? Oh, come on. If he could do Robin Hood without an accent, you know he can play <laughs> Jim Garrison. This guy was discredited for his Kennedy series. Elvis Mitchell, right? For, you writing a piece on this? What? Are you, you're not, are, are you, you offering me a job? No, you I'm not. Work? Are you writing a piece on the, on the thing? I'm doing a piece on, the, uh, the, on Oliver Stone for oh. Edge. For Edge, okay. December 4th. All right, there you go. Uh, tomorrow night, thank you, Elvis. Tomorrow night, we'll look at the American economy with Harvard Robert Reich. We'll also talk about the future of the New York Public Library and its miles of books with one of my favorite people, President of the Library, Timothy Healy, former president of Georgetown. Also, the hottest political question of the week, will David Duke be elected the next governor of Louisiana? All of that coming up tomorrow night. I thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you'll be back tomorrow night. Have a nice evening. <laughs>